Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Trina Shanks. I'm Director of Community Engagement at the School of Social Work and the Harold R. Johnson Collegiate Professor. And I'd like to introduce the Engage team that helped put this event on. Next slide, please. Um, so the team is Sonia Harb, Aisha Ghazi Edwin, Fatima Salman. We have two wonderful interns, Jamie Simmons and Blake Newman. And um, they've helped put this and all of our um, engaged sessions together. So I'd like to thank them for their work. Um, and a few, few quick notes about accessibility. Captions should be at the bottom of the screen. If you want to see the speaker view and the PowerPoint slides and not a lot of different faces, just hit speaker view at the top upper right hand corner of your um, of your photos of your of your video feed. Um, but this session today I'm really excited about it's it's focused on the power of the vote and how to vote in this election all the voting concerns and suppress suppression that might happen during the pandemic and it's my honor next slide to introduce our guest for today. We will have the Secretary of State of the state of Michigan Joycelyn Benson. We will have Brandon Snyder, who's Executive Director of Detroit Action, who'll be serving as a moderator for this first portion of our session. And then Kalia Spencer, who's attorney at Hangeman and member of the Detroit NAACP. And since we only have Secretary Benson for 30 minutes, I'm gonna turn it over to her so she can start off with some remarks. So Secretary Benson, it's on you. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me here today. And great to see all of you on the eve of really this historic election cycle or, or in the midst of it, really. I mean, already uh, 700,000 people have voted in Michigan and we have still got uh, three and a half weeks until the polls close. Uh, and so we're, you know, even in the midst of a pandemic, people want to vote. And that's remarkably inspiring and certainly something that we've been working to prepare for at the Department of State with partners all across the state of Michigan since I took office and in full force this year. Uh, that said, uh, one of the silver linings of this year, and it's reflected by the enormous turnout statistics we've already seen, is that citizens have options to vote like never before in our state. You can vote from home, you can vote early at your clerk's office today if you want to. You can vote, of course, at your local precinct on election day as well. You have options, each equally uh, secure and accessible and each available to every voter by right in our state today. And part of the challenge this year has been making sure citizens know about these rights. They were rights uh, in integrated into our state constitution in uh, November of 2018, when voters overwhelmingly voted to amend our state constitution to give themselves a right to vote by mail, and also giving themselves a right to register to vote up to and on election day itself. Uh, right now, uh, you can register to vote in person at your clerk's office with residency verification, and you can do that up until 8 p.m. on election day itself. So a citizen can wake up on election day, decide to vote, uh, show up at their clerk's office at 4 p.m., register, get their ballot and return it and will have voted. And that is an extraordinary thing when you consider the fact that just four years ago or even two years ago in 2018, citizens had to be registered a month prior to election day just to be able to vote in that election. That's no longer the case in our state. And on top of that, citizens are automatically registered to vote when they get a new driver's license or an ID or when they update their record, uh, which has re resulted in nearly a quarter of a million new voters registered in the past uh, year. Uh, that all is great news and it's why we're on track to see record numbers of people voting this fall. Uh, I believe that more people will vote in this fall's election in Michigan than have ever before voted in any election in Michigan's history. Uh, and that is an extraordinary good thing for democracy. Uh, it's extraordinary um, good thing uh, for our citizens uh, because it ensures more voices will be heard more than ever before. And it also reflects that citizens are taking advantage of these options because 
Now in a traditional year, if five and a half million people voted all in person at the polls on election day, we would see astronomical long lines, hours long lines for lots of different reasons. But that's not gonna be the case this year. Uh, in fact, if a, someone does choose to vote on election day, it is very likely they will not see a line at all, even in the midst of record turnout. And that's because the vast majority of citizens, likely 70% will have voted already. They'll have voted early in person at their clerk's office or at their home returning their ballot through the mail or at a local drop box. And that is again a reflection of the system that we've built at the Department of State this year, but a reflection really of the system that citizens have said they want by again amending our state constitution to create these new rules. Uh, and so notably uh, what we need now in this last three and a half weeks to go before the polls close on election night is your help making sure that every citizen in this state knows their options to vote this year. And those options include, uh, well, actually, let me take a step back. Not only knows their options to vote, but their options to ensure they're registered to vote as well. So step one is ensuring everyone knows you can go to michigan.gov slash vote to check your registration, confirm that it's up to date, and find out all that you need to get your ballot and return it. Your polling place location, your clerk's office location, your drop box locations. There's a link if you wanna have your ballot mailed to you. There's a link if you wanna download an application and fill it out and give it to your local clerk to pick up your or have your ballot mailed to you everything you need to know. You could track your ballot if you vote by mail uh, at michigan.gov slash vote. But first getting registered starts there. Uh, you can register to vote online if you're not already. You can update your registration if you need to, and you can download a registration form and take it to your clerk's office to register to vote. Now, if you do register online, it has to be done by October 19th to count for this election. But otherwise, if you wanna register, go to your clerk's office in those last two weeks and register. Secondly, when it comes to getting your ballot, help us let voters know their options. They can go to michigan.gov slash vote and request their ballot to be mailed to them. Uh, or by the way, you could go to Kroger's and pick up an application to have your ballot mailed to you and submit that to your local clerk. Uh, at lots of different ways to get your ballot at your home and vote from home. Uh, you can also pick your ballot up right now at your clerk's office and take it home with you and vote from home. And once you do vote from home, you can return that ballot through the mail. Although if you do that, we want you to do it soon and no later than October 20th. You can return it anytime before 8 p.m. on election day at a local drop box in your community. And again, you can get a list of your local drop boxes at michigan.gov slash vote. Or you can return it by dropping it off at your clerk's office or any satellite clerk's office in your community. Also, those locations at michigan.gov slash vote. Uh, so that's one option to vote. Just have your ballot mailed to you or take it home with you from the clerk's office, vote at home, and then return it one of those three ways by mail, at a drop box or at your clerk's office. The second way you can vote this year is early in person at your clerk's office or at a satellite voting office. For example, in Detroit, and in uh, Detroit, there are 21 additional satellite clerk's offices throughout the city. And then there are two main clerk's offices as well, making it 23 locations where you can show up and vote early in Detroit. Similarly, Ann Arbor has opened a uh, satellite clerk's office on Michigan's campus uh, at the uh, Ann Arbor Art Museum. Uh, so that's another uh, you know, example of if you go there, you can get your ballot, you can register to vote there too if you need, and you can return your ballot there or at your local Dropbox or through the mail. Finally, you can vote in person on election day at your local precinct as you may have done before. Uh, and uh, again, polls open 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. If you do show up at your local precinct, you can expect uh, minimal to zero lines, no crowding, social distancing guidelines in place, and poll workers wearing masks, gloves, sneeze guards, and having um, all the sanitization products needed to keep the polls clean and sanitized throughout the day. So we're ready to go. We've got options for citizens to vote this year. Citizens are taking advantage of them uh, already. As I mentioned, 700,000 citizens have voted in Michigan and we've still got about a month to go until the polls close. Uh, so it's an exciting time. It's a great time, but there's one dark cloud uh, that is hovering over our elections process and that's the cloud of misinformation. Uh, we anticipate and you know, I, I, it's not lost on me that as I say this, individuals are currently being 
Governor Reigned in Detroit for sending out to thousands of our residents robocalls telling them that they will um, or allegedly setting out these robocalls that they say, saying they will, if they vote by mail, all these terrible things will happen. They'll get on lists and they'll get mandatory this and that. And none of it's true. Nothing bad will happen if you vote by mail or vote from home. It's simply a convenient right that citizens have to cast their ballots this year. Uh, and But the Attorney General and I are taking serious and swift action to, to thwart any efforts to misinform our citizens about their right to vote. But we need your help with that because those efforts are only going to escalate and increase in volume in the weeks ahead. Uh, so if you see something, say something. Send it to us at misinformation at michigan.gov uh, and let us know anything you hear that seems off or seems uh, different and know that you have a website michigan.gov slash vote to get all of your voting needs and we've also set up a website michigan.gov slash election security where you can find all the information you need to know about what we're doing to secure your vote and secure the process and submit your questions if anything is unanswered. Uh, so again, we're ready to go. We're even ready to protect our election system against that dark cloud of misinformation, but we'll be most successful on all these fronts with your help. Educate voters about their rights and their options to register and vote this year and help citizens help us all push back to disarm those who would seek to misinform voters about their rights and so seeds of doubt among our electorate about the reality of our system and the sanctity and integrity of our elections. Uh, neither of us, neither the Attorney General or I or any of us should have any patience for those who would try to block anyone or suppress anyone from voting this year. And together we can ensure that those efforts, though they may be widespread and escalating, they will not succeed. That voters will vote in overwhelming numbers and that every vote will count and every Every voice will be heard. Um, so thank you again for this important conversation today. You've got really tremendous leaders who I've been working with for years on these issues and I'm just so proud to now be working alongside of them at the precipice of this historic election uh, where uh, we really will again see record-breaking turnout and voters being heard like never before. Thank you so much. Brandon, you want to take over the moderator role with um, a few questions for the secretary? Yeah, thank you, Trina. So uh, my name is Brandon Snyder. Uh, I'm the executive director at Detroit Action. Uh, we are a grassroots community-based organization building uh, political power for uh, working class black and brown folks here in the uh, metro region. Um, and we've been partners with uh, the School of Social Work here at, at the University of Michigan, as well as a number of the uh, programs here at, uh, at the University of Michigan uh, Detroit Center. And so I've been tasked at being the moderator for this section uh, with Secretary Benson. And so we'll be asking a number of questions that have been generated by students from the, uh, the School of Social Work. And then if there are questions that uh, I don't get to, feel free to ask questions in the uh, Q&A section on the Zoom. And so just wanna jump in, uh, Secretary Benson, and just talk about, um, I know that you gave a really a comprehensive uh, opening statement about uh, this year and the election and what the, uh, the Department of State has done for to ensure that people are, are, are safe during the, uh, to, to vote uh, in voting this year. But I just want to ask, you know, what are some things that people should be aware of, uh, you know, when they're trying to vote this year during the pandemic? I think the, the important word is vigilance and adapting. Um, you know, things may happen when you've got this many citizens voting in an infrastructure that's never held this many voters ever, than ever before, meaning um, and that's, you know, notwithstanding all the challenges, but the postal service and other variables and, you know, really nefarious efforts to, again, try to undermine the integrity of our elections and sow seeds of doubt among our electorate about the integrity of the vote. Uh, so, um, so that said, uh, we, you know, encourage citizens to make a plan to vote. Uh, start early. The earlier you have um, with that plan, the more you can adjust and adapt as necessary. If you want to request your ballot be sent to you, know that you can track it all online at michigan.gov slash vote, your request, the receipt of your ballot, uh, as well as uh, when it's received by the clerk. And know again, that you have options that you can work to your advantage to ensure your vote is counted up to and on election day itself. Uh, make sure also if you do vote from home or vote early, you, your job is to put your ballot in an envelope and then sign that envelope with a signature that matches the signature on your voter registration 
uh, form, which is likely the same signature you've got on your driver's license or state ID if you have one. Uh, either way, clerks are now required to reach out to voters if there is a missing or mismatched signature. And so know that you'll hear from your clerk if there is a challenge, if there is an issue, and you'll have time to correct it. It just has to be corrected by 8 p.m. on election day. Uh, the best point of contact for you is your local clerk's office on any questions you have. If you are, you're still waiting on your ballot and you're nervous and want to get it. Um, and then also, again, to underscore today, know that um, if you don't want to wait for your ballot to get to you through the mail, and if you want to return it as quickly as possible, um, you can go to your clerk's office uh, locally and pick up your ballot right now and register to vote right now and return your ballot right now. Uh, and uh, many clerks, as I mentioned, have set up satellite offices to handle the crowds over the next few weeks as well. So um, even if you've already requested your ballot be mailed to you, if you no longer want to wait, you can go to your clerk's office and, and pick up a ballot right there and then your previous request will be um, overridden once you get the new ballot. Uh, and, uh, and so that's, you know, an example of what you can do to adapt and adjust to uh, the evolving realities that you may be experiencing uh, and, and know that, you know, we're all committed at the local and state level to making sure your vote is counted and, you know, stay in communication with us if there are things we can help you troubleshoot. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. And then just to double down on some of the work that the Department of State is, um, is doing this year, I know that uh, you mentioned that you know this is a, a state right in this moment right now where there'll be a vast majority of people uh, you know voting by mail and voting absentee who have no, never voted by absentee previously. Um, you know right now, just some of the numbers that I'm seeing, like we're looking at record numbers of people voting voting by mail. Uh, you know some people still have questions about like ab about it, and you know because of some of the uh, the misinformation that you mentioned uh, from sources. You know, it's, you know, muddied the water, you know, so what would you say to ease concerns people may have about uh, voting absentee? Well, one, uh, to know that we've got more resources than ever before to help you track your ballot, affirm that it's counted. And as I mentioned, you know, lots of ways to, if at any point in the process you, you know, want to vote in person, you have that option up until Monday, the before election day at your clerk's office, and then on election day itself, even if you get your ballot mailed to you and you're just not worry, you're, you don't want to drop it off at a drop box or, you know, there, there are so many options that if you're not comfortable with one, even there, though they're all equally uh, uh, secure and accessible, if you're not comfortable with one, you can um, choose another uh, and you can adjust and adapt and you always have that fail safe as well, that safety net of just showing up to vote on election day if you haven't received your ballot or if you have your ballot and haven't returned it. Um, and so uh, the best thing to do is, is visit michigan.gov slash vote when you have questions. Uh, if you see misinformation or questionable information, send it to us at misinformation at michigan.gov. A lot of people, for example, over the weekend getting texts saying you've been purged from the rolls uh, and click here to get back on the rolls. Um, you know, not true. We haven't done a voter purge this year. Uh, and so we're, you know, we, we're pushing back on that. But a lot of that can either in intent or in effect scare people into thinking that, you know, people are out to stop them from voting. And while there's some, some accuracy to that, you know, the, the state officials are on your side. Myself, the attorney general, the governor, we're going to be using every tool at our disposal to protect every voter, regardless of who they vote for, regardless of where they live, regardless of how they vote, and ensure their voices are heard. Thank you for that. We got we got a couple of questions that uh, th that talk to your experience of being a voting rights expert and being in the uh, the voting rights space for a number of years. So uh, the first one is about uh, you know you know having worked for the uh, Southern, Southern Poverty Law Center and having you know been in, been in the voting rights space. You know what would you say to people who are uh, you know sort of on the fence about voting and like how do you talk about you know the the, the power of votes to fight supremacy and hate. I mean, there are, there are far more eloquent and smarter people than me on this call. I'm sure I could answer that question even better. And like yourself, Brandon, you guys have like Kalila, Spencer, you guys, you have these conversations as, you know, as part of, you know, the work that you've done for years. Uh, and so I think, you know, we, we try to be as Secretary of State, as election administrators, we try to be trusted sources of accurate information um, about, you know, the voting process this year. Um, but then also taking a step back, certainly, you know, my background is I did start this work as a voting rights and a civil rights lawyer. And, you know, for me, I feel that, and we all know this, there have been efforts since the founding of our country to stop 
voices from being heard and votes from being counted from communities as a way of altering and determining uh, who has power in our country. And that's ultimately what this is all about. And th the truth is under our constitution, voters have power. Every voter has power to determine everything else in our country and the elections, the voting process is, is what enables voters to use that power to determine who can make decisions and elect people to make decisions on their behalf. Uh, and we know that in that regard, people who have um, an imbalance of power, more power than others, try to use that to silence other voices and to deny that reality of one person, one vote, uh, in, which is again embedded in our in the heart of our democracy. Um, what gives me extraordinary hope though, and you know, what I see this year is that even in the midst of unprecedented attacks on our democracy and voter suppression and efforts to intimidate voters and you know, warn that there will be armed guards showing up at the polling places and sh sending out robocalls saying, you know, these terrible things will happen if you vote by mail, all this wrong and false information. Uh, people are still voting at record numbers. 200,000 citizens in Detroit have requested to vote by mail. This time in 2016, that number was 30,000. So we're, I mean, people have an extraordinary amount of engagement this year. And, um, and that is what really is the other, the other side of our democracy. That there, though there have been efforts throughout history to thwart the voice of the people, the voice of the people always overcome those efforts. It takes sacrifice. It takes um, a lot <laughs> I and mean, people have died as we know, people have been beaten. You know, it takes a lot to overcome those efforts, but, but history shows we overcome them. And the fight continues and the battle continues. And it, it frankly, in, in my way, never ends because we always have to stay vigilant. Um, but you know, that's when it all gears down to just one person with one vote choosing to exercise it. That's the best way to fight back against everything from systemic racism and structural racism to you know, voter suppression efforts on the granular level. Your vote is your voice, your vote is your power. Um, and when you use it, uh, there is you know, nothing that can match that power. No, right on. And I think that, you know, for, for the work that we do at Detroit Action and even our, uh, you know, our forefather at Detroit Action Commonwealth, you know, we think about uh, voter suppression, not just being, uh, you know, armed guards and people, you know, blocking the, uh, you know, blocking, blocking the ballot, but make it, but people not having the right information or not having the, the sort of motivation to vote. And so, you know, I guess I'm, I'm curious about like, you know, the, the infrastructure that we're, that, that's been built for this moment you know, will some of these things, you know, that we're doing right now to increase, um, you know, voting access, you know, will they be used after the pandemic? What are we looking to, to um, or ideas that we're yeah. looking to, yeah, to increase, uh, increase access once this pandemic is, is hopefully over? Well, importantly, you know, this year is a reflection of two, you know, perfect storms coming to our state. One, this, these new rights that are in our constitution, enshrined in our constitution, they're not going away. Yeah. The yeah. right to vote by mail, all those things, the right to register to vote up to an on election day, it's a new date for democracy in our state. The pandemic has increased the urgency with which we've worked to educate the public about these rights because we want them to know about these choices, they're new, um, but they're not going away. And in, in fact, they'll only increase, I anticipate, in popularity and in, in efficacy in the years to come. Yeah. Awesome, and speaking of Prop 2, which, uh, uh, Detroit Action was a member of the coalition, the Promote the Vote Coalition to help pass that. Uh, you know, I want to just talk a little bit about uh, automatic voter registration and, um, and, and same day voter registration. Um, you know, are there efforts to, you know, to sort of, you know, automatically uh, uh, register, you know, young people when they, when they become 18? Yes, I mean, one, once someone gets their driver's license or state ID in our state, you can uh, become automatically registered to vote if you're eligible, if you're an eligible voter. But secondly, also on top of that, uh, if, you know, if you, if you want to register and vote, as I mentioned, even on election day itself, you have that right. And this is now, we actually had three elections in 2019 in local communities across the state and three elections already this year, November's will be our fourth. And in every election that we've had where citizens have been able to register to vote up to an on election day, the vast majority of people taking advantage of those of that new right has been 18 and 19 years old, year old voters. Um, and that's extraordinarily encouraging because again, it shows that, um, that our younger voters, our youngest voters are preparing to inherit our democracy, getting engaged and finding the new convenient ways to register and cast your ballots. Uh, as you know, important avenues to being engaged and expressing their voice.
Yeah, one of the things that we're doing really to take advantage of that uh, same day voter registration is we're having parties at the polls here in the city of Detroit. So we're bringing young folks down to the uh, Department of Elections, uh, 18 and 19 year olds, where they can you know meet music artists, uh, you know mm. have food, and uh, and more importantly, go right across the street and register to vote and, and vote on the same day. So I think that uh, just like you mentioned, you know, 18 and 19 year olds and young people, you know, who may not be aware of the election broadly or may not be as um, tuned in as, as, as you or I, if people are, you know, so inspired or if they, you know, have the right messages from their friends, family, and neighbors, you know, can get inspired and register and without the hassle and the hoops. And I think that's one of the best things that we've had uh, thus far with, uh, with Prop 3. Um, so just, I guess, just one of, one of my final questions is, you know, our organization, a part of our, lar our constituency, you know, includes people who are, uh, are formerly incarcerated, people who've been locked up, you know, as well as their families. Uh, and, you know, there's a ton of uh, misinformation and disinformation about who can and who can't vote. Uh, do you mind like clearing that up for folks and letting them be aware of like what rights are available to, to, uh, to Michiganders who may have been in contact with the criminal legal system? Yes, importantly, in Michigan, unless you're in prison serving a sentence, you can vote. Uh, is the moment you're released from prison, you can vote. If you're in jail or prison awaiting a sentence, you can vote absentee. Uh, so you have enormous rights to vote and certainly, uh, and, and importantly, you know, regardless of, of any interactions you may or may not have had with law enforcement in the past, uh, it does not affect your right to vote in Michigan. Uh, at pro probation, parole, unpaid parking tickets, nothing impacts your right to vote in Michigan. Uh, and so uh, certainly we know that one of the biggest pieces of misinformation, particularly in the communities of color, is just that. Uh, but communities all across the state, as I've looked at, uh, frankly, the, the, the communities, the, 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 the neighborhoods where uh, voter uh, engagement and turnout is the lowest. And as, I, as I've gone to those communities, and they're in Flint and Detroit, but they're also in Sturgis and Jackson and Benton Harbor and other cities or townships across the state. Every conversation I had, voters have said, well, I assumed, and these are voters of all backgrounds. Well, I assume because of my criminal history, I can't vote or because I have a parking ticket, I can't vote. None of that is true. You can vote. Um, and if you have any questions at all, uh, you can you know, go to uh, michigan.gov slash vote. And it very clearly states that regardless of any aspect of your criminal history, or again, even if you're awaiting a uh, trial, awaiting a sentence, um, or serving a sentence of probation or parole, you can vote. Awesome. And just, you know, what, what resources are for people who are unable to vote due to legal status? What, are, what, what do we tell to our friends who are undocumented here in the state? Well, certainly citizenship uh, is, you know, a mark of, of being able to vote uh, and it is something that's that's very vigorously enforced. Uh, and so we want everyone to know that, that you have to be a citizen to vote. Uh, even permanent residents don't have a right to vote in our in our state. And that's why when you register to vote and various other steps in the process, there is uh, a requirement that you sign with penalty of perjury to affirm your citizenship. Uh, so we want people to know that and, and uh, ensure that um, well, we're, we're grateful to, to be an inclusive community in so many ways. Uh, the ability to vote is reserved for citizens over the age of 18 in our state and in our country. Thank you so much for that. And I just, just one final question we have before we uh, let you go and enjoy the rest of your day. Um, you know, again, you know, taking health precautions uh, as people are going out to, to vote and the number of the people who are on this call and the number of people that we're engaging with are going to be asked to be, to be poll workers. Uh, you know, what health precautions are being taken to ensure the, uh, the health and safety of poll workers? And then what advice really would you give people who are going to be poll working, maybe for the first time? Make sure, first advice, make sure you know everything you can uh, about uh, serving as a poll worker. The state has actually created additional webinars uh, that supplement any training you may have received from the city of Detroit. Um, get access to those webinars, watch them, uh, become familiar with them, uh, ask questions during your training. Know that you have the most important role in our democracy if you're our poll worker. You are our MVP of democracy. And we will have so many people serving in those roles for the first time this year. Uh, and we really do want to ensure that they are fully prepared to do the important jobs that, that, are, that lie before them. Uh, so uh, if, you, uh, if you need access to those training modules, let us know. Uh, they should be available at our democracy MVP site, which is michigan.gov slash democracy MVP. 
Uh, but, uh, but certainly, thank you. If you're planning to be an election worker or poll worker, be prepared for a challenging day, but a beautiful day where you will be on the front lines of preserving democracy for all of your fellow citizens. Awesome. Secretary Benson, thank you so much. Uh, thank looking, you. Good to see you. Looking forward to working together. Good to see you as well. Uh, take care. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much. Bye. Yeah, I'm gonna, yeah so I'm going to pass it back to Trina, and I'm going to... Uh, I'm going to go off mute. Go on mute. All right. Thank you so much, Secretary Vincent. Thank you, Brandon, for moderating at that portion. Um, right now, we're going into uh, uh, our panel with Brandon Snyder as a as a discussant, um, and Kalia um, from NAACP um, as uh, on the panel as well. And Aisha is going to moderate that portion of our conversation. So, Aisha, I'm turning it over to you. Okay. Great. Thank you so much, Brandon, and thank you for asking those questions. Um, welcome everyone. And you know, I think that Jocelyn shared some great information about voting logistics and also how they're increasing voting access, but we know that voter suppression happens whether or not it's a pandemic. And during this next segment, we're going to have two panelists on who've really dedicated their career and their work to fighting voter suppression and increasing access for everyone. Um, so I want to give a few minutes, maybe five minutes to both Brandon Snyder and Quila Spencer to introduce yourselves talk about the work you do around voting, and then we're gonna go into some questions. And I do wanna note, I, we see some questions are coming in on Q&A, thanks for asking those, and there will be some, a period at the end where we have some question and answer with the audience. So take it away. Uh, I guess I could start. So, uh, so I'm Brandon Snyder, I'm the Executive Director of Detroit Action. Uh, and when I'm not uh, you know, serving as a, a, a panelist, or a, uh, a moderator for, uh, for town halls. You know, I lead a, a grassroots organization that is building people power. We, are, uh, we, we believe in the power of people to make decisions and to, uh, and to win material gains for our community. So our, our work you know, revolves around housing, jobs, criminal justice uh, reform, public education, access to good quality education here in, uh, in the state and uh, democracy reform, which a lot of the conversation that we're talking about today is about democracy. Um, and so for us, when we think about, you know, uh, people power and we think about, you know, uh, activism, uh, you know, you know it, the, it sounds cliche, but organizing and, uh, and, and getting folks out to vote is just one tool in the toolbox for us. So, so I got into this work and I got involved in organizing um, uh, while I was at the University of Michigan as an undergrad, uh, I, you know, I was a first generation student. My, uh, my parents uh, and their grandparents, you know, actually are, are lifelong Detroiters. My, uh, my, my folks moved here to the state in the, uh, in the 1930s uh, during the Great Migration uh, to escape white terror in the South and for access to good quality uh, working class jobs. Uh, you know, in, in factories and, uh, you know, that the unions were providing. But when we think about, uh, you know, those sort of jobs and the type of quality of life that, uh, that you know, my folks, you know, had for me or that the, uh, the folk, young people or that, uh, you know, people moved to, to the Midwest for, you know, you see a lot of those jobs, you see a lot of those opportunities, uh, you know, fading from view, you know, partly because of, of massive economic uh, failures and uh, a lack of opportunity for, uh, you know, people to, to engage in the system and make decisions um, at the policy level. So, you know, when I went to the University of Michigan, I was uh, really interested in that, uh, in, in that question around opportunity, the op of, like how do people, some people, you know, have, you know, access to all the opportunity and there's how are some people like uh, my friends and my family who are, you know, struggling to make, uh, make it between, uh, make, you know, make, make ends and are working pay, uh, check to check. So I got involved with uh, the University of Michigan NAACP. I was involved in the Black Student Union. I was involved in my fraternity, uh, Kappa Alpha Psi at the University of Michigan. And uh, you know, I, you know, I, I learned a lot about the power of bringing folks together to make decisions. Um, but really, two consequential things happened in my life uh, that made me decide that this is the moment that I want to. Um, this is the type of work that I want to spend. Um, you know, spend my life doing, and it's and it's important. One was uh, that I got swept up in the sea of hope and change in 2008, 
And so I was a, 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 an Obama super volunteer. You know, I was uh, skipping, skipping class to knock on doors in Ann Arbor and Detroit, uh, registering other students, uh, making phone calls, et cetera. Uh, and I was also doing that on the side of taking a class with my mentor, uh, Dr. Greg Marcus, where he was teaching about community organizing theory. And in that community organizing theory class, we had a project where we went to, the, uh, to Detroit to, uh, to work with uh, folks in soup kitchens and build power for homeless, formerly incarcerated, working class Detroiters. Uh, and, you know, that, that project became the Detroit Action, uh, Detroit Action Commonwealth and now Detroit Action. But uh, you know, I think that for me, the first time seeing that, you know, there were people who were my neighbors, there were people who were my family friends who, you know, you know, who, who were the barriers or opportunity weren't just people working hard, it was actual systemic things that took place, you know, became crystal in that moment. And I would say the second part of that, of, of the, the, the crystallized this moment for me around organizing was that uh, towards the, my senior year of college when I was ready to graduate, I got arrested and I actually got, uh, you know, for a very brief period was, uh, was in the Washington County Jail, you know, waiting bail, um, you know, embarrassed to tell my family and friends. And I would meet folks from all across Ann Arbor and all across Ypsilanti who are younger than me. So, you know, here I am 21 and these are folks who are, you know, 16 to, uh, to 20 and they were going to prison. And, you know, for me being a working class person, you know, I was really confused about like, how is it that I was seen as the person who was, you know, had all the opportunity and was a privileged person where, you know, for much of my life, that was not the case. Um, my same mentor, once I got my legal situation resolved, uh, you know, pulled me to his office hours and talk to me about the, the parable of the babies in the river, the parable of the river. And the idea around it is, you know, we think about all of the work around activism, around service, uh, and around changing systems and around the problems that we see as like this big mountain and the problems and the people who are impacted by it are, you know, babies in a river. Um, well, a lot of the work focuses on getting the babies out of the river, drying them off, you know, sometimes feeding them or educating them about like why they're in the river in the first place. But nobody ever stops to really say, you know, why are the babies in the river and why is that a problem and what we're going to do to stop it. And community organizing, you know, for me is about not just, you know, asking that question about like, why are babies in the river in the first, you know, in the first place, but making sure there are no babies in the river ever again, and then holding the people accountable who put the babies in the river. So very crazy, long out, drawn out metaphor, but for me, that stuck with me and talked to me about the idea that we have power as people, both in our democracy, as well as in our, um, as, as, you know, building community groups and making, you know, collective decisions to, uh, to, to be able to, to engage and create change for our communities. And so we use elections as one of the opportunities to do so. That was amazing. Uh, Brandon, thank you so much. And I like that analogy you use of the babies in the river. It reminds me of upstream and downstream kind of social determinants of health that we talk about. So, I, you know, we're going to expand on that. But go ahead, Kalila. Thank you, Ayesha. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm just in awe of Brandon's story, and so I appreciate um, him sharing it with all of us. Um, I am a double Michigan graduate. I I hate to date myself, but I'm a little older. Um, and so I, I came through in the um, Grutter Gratz era, I'll say for lack of a better term. And so I'm a poli sci major, graduated in 99 and graduated law school in December of 01. And so I was actually in law school during Bush Gore. Some of you hopefully remember that in some realm. But that's when I really became really interested in what I'll call disenfranchisement. Um, as part of my studies in political science, one of my focuses was political efficacy, which is really the role of the electorate in determining who our leaders are and how our government is run. And the, the first prong of that is really voting um, and really understanding how we as individual citizens feel a part of the democ democratic process, as well as how we feel that we personally affect that process by engaging and in, um, enfranchising. Um, my background is a, an attorney, as I stated before. I have currently serve as Honigman's Inclusion, Equity, and Social Responsibility Partner. Honigman is one of the largest Michigan law firms, and we focus on business litigation. But in my volunteer role, I'm heavily involved with the Michigan State NAACP, as well as the Detroit Branch NAACP. Um, as part of that coalition and um, really work since 05 in election protection, 
with the NAACP, we really formed a coalition with our partners, um, ACLU of Michigan and League of Women Voters and others on Prop 3 in 2018. And I was part of the legal team that drafted the amendment and really worked to make sure that we overwhelmingly passed that um, amendment to the Constitution in 2018. And so I appreciate um, really everyone's involvement in the effort as well as Detroit Action's involvement. Um, my role currently is really just um, continuing with making sure that we implement Prop 3, um, promote the vote, is still involved. Um, one of our involvements is also the redistricting process, which I won't get into today, but I'm sure in years to come, we'll be talking about that after this election. But we are currently working with those same partners in really the implementation of Prop 3. And um, you'll probably have seen some social communications about michiganvoting.org. Um, I am currently the lead on the rapid response effort. So we're looking at voter suppression issues. We're looking at access issues, as well as implementing, um, I'll call it rapid response processes to address concerns around access or lack of access to the democratic process here in Michigan, especially in light of COVID-19 restrictions. Um, and so I'm happy to talk about that in detail, but I don't wanna sort of foreshadow our slides too much, but just recognize that there are people on the ground who are willing to help and assist and hopefully you'll get information today about how you can also be part of that process as well as really be um, integral in making sure that everyone has access to the ballot in this election. Thank you so much, Kalila. And thank you both of you for just sharing your inspiring stories and your work. If we can go to the next slide, we're gonna ask a few panel questions and I urge you all in the audience, if you have a question, submit it in the Q&A and we can help to integrate it into our conversation. So we've talked a little bit about this already, right? But I wanna get into specifics. We know that voter suppression happens whether or not we're in a pandemic, but how may it look different um, with us, with so many people voting remotely? And either one of you just jump on in. Okay. Um, I will say this, um, we are in a place where we're seeing the confluence of technology and remote work um, and really conflicting with those that had access to those tools. Um, what we've seen from our efforts in terms of voter protection is that there is a, a gap and, and the biggest gap is technology and information. You know, we have um, a situation where clerk's offices are not going to be open. Um, we have a situation where they're not going to be the access to resources. And so some of that is misinformation and the other part is lack of access. And so um, Secretary Benson did talk a lot about um, robocalls. We're also seeing um, complaints about robo text messages, um, mailers, about misinformation. Um, and because people are looking to vote by mail, there's a lot of misinformation around vote by mail. And so misinformation is a definitely a key thing that we've touched on a little bit with Secretary Benson, but also recognize that mailers, social media, and frankly, what I'll call myths for a better term. Um, some of you have touched on that when you talked about felony enfranchisement. Um, some of the myths are really a, a product of, um, I'll say media. You know, people are watching television and they're watching television that's not focused on Michigan. So if I'm watching uh, MSNBC or CNN or Fox News and they're talking about early voting in Georgia or early voting in Virginia, there's a connotation that that's applicable across all the states and all the states have different election laws. And so what we found is really there's a misconstruction of what early voting is in Georgia versus what early voting is is in Michigan. In Michigan, we have early voting, but it is in the form of in-person AV voting. And so people have some, some misinformation about that process. In addition, there's been a lot of news about felons not being able to vote in Florida. Well, that's not the case in Michigan. And so that's also a source of the misinformation that's happening. Um, so misinformation to me is probably the key thing um, but Brandon can speak on what they're hearing at Detroit Action. No, I think Kalila uh, talked about a lot of what we're hearing and what we're seeing, and uh, and you know also the you know the, the the need to sort of combat it. 
And so for me, um, one of the things that we've, that, that we've noticed is, you know, again, there is a ton of, you know, social media disinformation where you see these uh, social media accounts prop up, uh, you know, they may spend a few hundred dollars in ads and they're sharing around memes or sharing around information and it looks really convincing. And in fact, it's, uh, it's counter to what's happening here in Michigan. And that's really, that really impacts uh, younger people. It really impacts, uh, you know, people who are not as tech savvy. And it also impacts, you know, uh, you know, also, unfortunately, a lot of, you know, older folks who, you know, who are, you know, who, who are getting this information and they may, they, they may be getting it shared from a trusted source. So for us, you know, what we've really been trying to do as, as Detroit Action, and it's our sort of central to our, to our organizing work is really be a trusted um, uh, mediator for, for good information for what it looks like to, uh, to express and engage uh, in community, um, in, in community engagement and civic engagement. And a lot of that means really being able to be vigilant around, uh, you know, bad robo dials or uh, robo techs, but also making sure that we're working in tandem with folks like the NAACP, um, with folks like the ACLU and the League of Women Voters, so that when we hear something, when we see something online, we're able to uh, to point it out. And and then just finally, I'll say like, you know, the, I think the broadest way that we think about. Um, uh, disinformation and misinformation and how it impacts, uh, uh, you know, voting, whether we're in a pandemic or not, is that, you know, it suppresses the vote. It makes people not be interested in wanting to show up. So when people get even bad information about candidates, you know, that is a, a, is a tactic of uh, misinformation and disinformation to make sure that people, you know, lose enthusiasm and are disinterested in, in taking the time to engage in the process. And so we have to be vigilant about um, not just the process, but also what we're hearing about candidates. You know, that's some, you know, that is a thing that um, I know we won't cover in this mo in this conversation, but that's a thing that is also, you know, lumped into the conversations around um, misinformation and disinformation. Yeah. Oh, go ahead, Kalila. And then I was just going to um, add, and I know I have a slide in there somewhere about lack of access. And this is something yeah. that we found due to COVID um, is really a problem. Um, Clerks have reduced hours and times because of COVID-19. Um, they have staff that are frankly fearful of the public right now. And so you will hear about some clerk's offices saying that they don't have um, access to AB ballots for in-person quote early voting. And so we've been tracking that information as well, as well as the fact that um, due to some closures at the Secretary of State and the delay in people being able to update their state IDs and driver's licenses, some of the online tools are not available to them because they haven't been able to change their address. They haven't been able to apply for um, the state IDs and driver's license that allow the online registration and tracking of AB ballots to work for them. And so that combined with the lack of clerk access because they're not able to call those clerks is creating what I'll call voter suppression as well. In other words, because of those complications from COVID-19 and the closures that we had early in the year, people are not able to address, or I should say utilize the remote tools that are available. And in addition, frankly, as many of you know, those tools are only available to those that have the means to have them. In other words, not everyone has access to home internet. Everybody does not have access to the type of technology that's necessary to um, really access um, those online platforms. And so um, they don't have fax machines to fax in their AB ballot application. They don't have, well, even if they have Wi-Fi, it may not have the bandwidth or um, the software technology that really interfaces with those online program platforms that are available through the Secretary of State and other avenues. And so we're definitely seeing that, particularly in those areas where you have a socioeconomic or other gap in access. And lastly, transportation is always going to be an issue in the state unless we address public transportation for those to have the ability to go to the clerk's offices for in-person AV or the polls in general. Thank you both so much. And I love how you guys really talked about how voter suppression is both misinformation and it's lack of access, right? And it's intentional misinformation. It's, it's aimed at disenfranchising and demotivating people. Um, you know, with that, we know as social workers, and most, most of us, we know that voter suppression was intentional, 
And it was a, it was a very key aspect of institutionalized racism in this country. So I want to move on and talk next about the populations. We know it, we know it disproportionately affects and it targets black and brown folks. Um, but who are the most affected right now? Who you guys are really worried about? Uh, Fatima, if you can go to the next slide, please. And then the one after that. Um, I can speak to this a little bit. We've already talked about um, our felons, our, our um, people with a criminal record. There's a lot of misinformation and a lot of lack of motivation because of that misinformation. And I think Secretary Benson cleared up a lot of it with her portion. I also wanted to highlight those who are disabled. And um, in my view, disability is not just physical, it's also mental. And making sure that we recognize that everyone doesn't have a grasp of how the process works, as well as access to the enfranchisement. And so we've been working a lot with folks about really just informing them about you may see someone and you may assume that they're fine. Um, they don't have a limp, they don't have a wheelchair, et cetera, but we shouldn't assume that they have the same ability. And so we've seen a lot of, I'll uh, call it pushback from clerks about saying, well, they're not disabled, what's the problem? And the reality is, you know, no one knows, no one can track someone's disability. And so we just need to make sure that all polling locations and all applications are accessible. And I'm, I'm glad to see that you've at least done that, your part with respect to the Zoom and the closed caption and what have you. And so we really need to recognize that. I know that the Secretary of State is working on those issues, but making sure that the individual clerks have an understanding of their responsibility is also important. Um, I also want to add language access and frankly illiterate. Um, illiteracy is an issue in our state. Um, it's something that we really need to work on. and it's really important that people understand there's a difference between the literacy that's required to function in a particular job versus what I'll call, for lack of a better term, civic literacy. Um, some of the questions that we're getting about ballots is just simple stuff like, what color ink pen do I use? Um, if I click on a particular circle, if I do straight party ticket and then click um, and fill out ovals for individual candidates, am I spoiling my ballot? And a lot of this um, comes from really lack of experience in the election process. Those of us who vote in every election don't have these same questions as those who vote in every other maybe presidential election. Maybe folks were engaged with Obama, but they were engaged in the last 2016 election. So they sort of have a gap in their knowledge and really need to know what the changes in the law are. So if you were voting in 2016, you may have recognized that you had a straight party ticket option, but then in 2018, you didn't. And so when people see it, they're like, okay, is this a real ballot? Is this real? Like, I thought we didn't have this option before. And so part of it is really just civic literacy and understanding and following the changes in the law from the 28th, um, 2018 Prop 3 ballot. In addition, young people year in and year out are um, not given the, the right access, they're not given the same access. Part of it is because people are delayed in getting their state IDs and driver's licenses. Um, there's a change in the culture. I remember when I was 16, long ago, I couldn't wait to get my driver's license, but that's not necessarily, necessarily the case with young people, as well as the fact that they don't all have access to get those, you know, driver's trading, et cetera, et cetera. So recognizing that young people is a gap and it's also propounded by the fact that in COVID-19, some campuses don't have the same access in person versus online classes. And so we're seeing a lot of that with first-time voters having questions about AV ballot versus in-person voting. And then again, year in and year out, the poor. Um, that is, I think, probably the biggest um, thing that we see year in and year out. And some of these things obviously intersect with another, um, but just recognizing that the, in our country, we don't really make sure that the, the poor have access to the ballot. And that really goes to the access that we were talking about before. Kalila, I love that you mentioned these special populations. I want to jump in real quick. Um, so, you know, I also do work for an organization called Detroit Disability Power. And we've launched this GOTV Get Out the Vote campaign in Detroit. Because after our serving, we found that almost 60% of polling locations just weren't accessible. Like a, per, a voter in a wheelchair would go up to a polling location and there would be steps to get in. 
or the accessible voting machine would be broken. So we've also found, and there was research done on this, that if all people with disabilities were given the right to vote, they were, they're a large enough voting block to swing an, an election. And in Detroit alone, 20% of the population um, has a disability. So it's, it's what you said, Kalila, those compounding kind of marginalized identities that end up literally putting up obstructions for some people to practice their right to vote. Um, so I'm really happy that you, that you spoke on that. So anyway, Brandon, why don't you go ahead and, and jump in? I know you have a lot of information on this as well. Uh, I would just also say that like one of the things when we talk about, uh, you know, the need for like civic literacy is that, you know, this also impacts people who are like pretty well to do and also pretty educated too. <laughs> you know, I, I think that that's a key thing to like consider. So, you know, a lot of times, people, you know, it's, it's assumed that we're talking about, you know, just working class folks, low income folks or not, but, you know, it's also people who are, you know, pretty well to do, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's how often you participate in the system. Um, case in point, I have, I have a cousin who uh, follows me on Facebook and Twitter, and you know I, I forget what he does, but uh, wanted to vote for Rashida Tlaib in the um, in the August primary, but didn't live in her district and wasn't aware that he didn't live in her district. And so, you know, just like the, the understanding around like what gerrymandering is, the fact that there are you know different congressional districts and like where the lines are is also important, and also you know just speaks to the need to be able to have robust community organizations and mediating institutions that, that, that offer this sort of civic education, you know, on a year round basis. Um, and so that's where we come in as, as Detroit Action is we wanna be able to, you know, create a militant base of working class, black and brown folks. Um, maybe militant is the right word, but I'm gonna use it. But, uh, but uh, you know, a, a folks who are, you know, committed and dedicated to the electoral and civic process and understand what's going on and understand how um, it's connected to our values. You know, and, you know, one of the, 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 the best places that we think about that is when we talk about uh, disenfranchisement of felons and, and people who've been impacted by a criminal legal system in the state. Um, so we know legally that anybody who's, um, you know, who, 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 as long as they're not serving a sen sentence can vote here in the state, but there's so much disinformation around the fact that who can and who can't because of many of the things that Cleveland mentioned, that there are people who believe that, hey, my vote doesn't matter because I've served this, uh, you know, I've, I've served a sentence or I'm on probation. And what ends up happening is that these people don't believe they have a say or a stake in the political process. They don't believe that their vote matters or that they, they have a say even in policy. And you know, this information is coming from a number of sources. It's coming from some of the things that Cleveland mentioned around, like, you know, people seeing, you know, stories about things on TV, but it's also coming from probation officers, parole officers, and family members, people who, you know, aren't clear on the story themselves. And if it's being rooted in, uh, in, in institutions, then, you know, we have to do, you know, as institutions, we have to be on guard and be able to attack that and break that down through our relationships. So I think that that's just one key place that we're thinking about, uh, you know, disinformation and making sure that we're, um, you know, attacking it. The other part I think is just as it as it relates to you know young black and brown folks and people who've been, um, you know, been locked up and whatnot is that we ultimately want to be able to you know in our theory of change as Detroit Action we want to be able to move away from a system that is punitive and move towards a system that that centers care, and that that requires you know there, it you know people who have had direct contact with the criminal legal system, you know, actually being decision makers. And, you know, it means that, you know, we actually have to be investing in the, uh, in the civic education and also the opportunity for them to be stakeholders in this process. So doing more work where we're, figure, where we're targeting them, doing more work where we're having conversations that combat disinformation and misinformation for folks who are disabled or uh, non-English speakers, et cetera, like, like DPP does, you know, so that we can actually have the people who, you know, that, you know, who are impacted by the system be the stakeholders and have a policy um, um, system as well as a, a, a electoral system that is rooted in care. So I, those are the only things I want to add to it. And I think that, you know, the policy work that we've done over the past few years around, even with uh, Prop 3, Promote the Vote, you know, Really tries to remove the barriers and break down the uh, the barriers that 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 inhibit people from being able to vote. Like if like if my mom, you know, who had two jobs, you know, you know, had to like squeeze in going to vote early in the morning, 
But like, if you know, being able to vote earlier and before E Day, Election Day, allows people like that to really be able to have a say in the um, system and be able to vote for folks who have their values and their best interests in mind. Right. And like you said, like, why isn't voting? Why isn't election day a holiday? Because all the people who already have these marginalized, multiple marginalized identities, they have they experience even more obstruction to vote, right? Um, you know, one of the things that you mentioned, Brandon, that I thought was really great was the thing about like, this doesn't just affect people who are marginalized. This is also about like us just not having enough education to be empowered about our civic our civic identities. So many of us don't know what congressional district we live in. And we talk about like, you know, in school, we should teach kids how to balance their check, their checkbook, but we should also teach kids how to practice their right to vote um, and just their, their civic efficacy and empowerment. So I think that was a great point. Um, you know, I want to address a question that came up earlier in the chat about limited English speakers or limited English proficient speakers um, around poll workers and how you can help. So, you know, as one of the populations whose, whose vote I think is also very suppressed are people who whose English is not is, is not their first language and many of them don't know that when they go into the poll when they go into polls and they go to vote they can bring someone in to help them uh, to be a translator there's just a lack of information out there so we can drop some organizations into the chat that you can reach out to if you're interested in serving as a bilingual poll, poll worker or um, provide translating assistance in any way do you guys have anything else that you want to add to that in regards to language assistance? Um, I just wanted to uplift the michiganvoting.org website. We do have a Know Your Rights guide that's been translated to Spanish, Arabic, Bengali, and possibly others. And so michiganvoting.org, you can go to that. It's a downloadable Know Your Rights guide. Um, and so we're trying to make the website more accessible in and of itself. But obviously, um, the Know Your Rights guide has been translated and I'm pretty sure if you inquire on that website, you may be able to get in print, um, printed actual Know Your Rights guides in the various languages as well. That's amazing. Thank you for sharing that. Okay, so we are going to move on to our next question. Uh, Fatima, if you can go to the next slide. And this is what you just mentioned, right? <laughs> I was you making the slides down. late at night, so I, you know, my memory you is. Got it down. You got it down. <laughs> <laughs> um, so here's this website. That's great. Thank you for sharing that. Okay, so Fatima, if you can go to the next slide. So yeah, what can we do? What can we do to get involved, to help out? I was going to leave it for Brandon to go first, but. <laughs> oh, oh, sure. okay. Well, well, cool. So um, our work at Detroit Action is about uh, engaging uh, low uh, propensity, which is, you know, infrequent or new voters. That's that's a technical term, but it's like infrequent or new voters. Our, our work is really about talking to them and our the people we talk to, you know, are a lot of the folks that was mentioned on that previous slide that uh, Cleela put up about, you know, young people, people who have, um, um, and been impacted by the criminal legal system, but also um, people who are homeless and formerly homeless and also people who are renters, you know, so, you know, the best way if you're interested in like, you know, having a direct conversation with them and, you know, really talking about like the values that, you know, you share and the values that they share and like how we can create a world that in a policy and, and, and a politic that reflects those values, you know, we're interested in like having those conversations with people. Um, and we got about a hundred and more than 100,000 folks that we're trying to talk to, you know, between now and the election day to do it. And so um, if you're interested in making calls, if you're interested in sending text messages, uh, you can go to uh, DetroitAction.org um, and our join us and we'll uh, get you plugged in. And there's also a Mobilize America link that we have. Mobilize, uh, I, I, can, I can send a link later, but the best way to get involved is our uh, our DetroitAction.org uh, website. And so this is, you know, direct voter contact and direct democracy is like, we want to be able to talk to folks and get them engaged. And then I can speak a little bit about our voter protection efforts and I'm glad that they went to the next slide. Um, we were able to secure with the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under the Law, a Michigan specific voter um, hotline center. So all calls directed at Michigan um, voter questions has been directed to what we'll call a dedicated hotline, 
where we have over 100 volunteers that are well versed in the changes after Prop 3, as well as um, the responsibilities and um, election administration changes that follow Prop 3. And so if you call this number, um, they will be basically put in touch with a lawyer, law student, or legal professional that's been trained to answer questions. Um, if they can resolve those questions, some of those questions are, am I registered? They'll look up on the statewide website if they're registered. And when they do that, if they are registered, they're able to tell them who their clerk is, um, where the nearest drop box is, and whether or not they have requested an AV ballot and if it has been sent and or received. So the, we're really giving some tools to those that don't have that online access. If they are able to phone us, we are able to use our tools and look those things up for them. Um, there's, as you can see, the different translations. And also for those who are not able to speak on the phone, if you go on the website, I believe it's 866 Our Vote, and um, you are able to do a web chat and get the same answers um, via a text message function or web chat function for those that aren't able to call the um, hotline. Um, as part of that effort for rapid response, in terms of voter protection, we look at four buckets of work. So we've talked a little bit about the hotline. We're also recruiting poll challengers. Um, these are nonpartisan poll challengers. And to be a poll challenger, you do have to be um, registered to vote in Michigan. We're also recruiting poll workers. And so we also have a poll, working, poll worker recruitment tool on michiganvoting.org where we're working with Power to the Polls as well as the Secretary of State's Democracy MVP program to really recruit poll workers. I will say at this point, we have recruited over 7,000 poll workers. And so I think uh, all the clerks of the Secretary of State are like, okay, we, we got enough now. Um, that said, to the extent that there are areas where you think that there's a need, um, I would say it is bilingual poll workers, um, Arabic and Spanish being the predominant ones. And to the extent that you are not tapped to be a poll worker, we are also recruiting poll watchers. So if you aren't registered, you can be a poll watcher. If you are registered, you can be a poll challenger. And so um, if you wanna to go to the next slide, just talk a little bit about that. Um, poll challengers, our, our view is that poll challengers are really there to challenge what I'll call the partisan challengers. In other words, the view is that um, you're gonna have Republicans and Democratic challengers in the polling locations. And unfortunately, what they do is they concentrate in areas of color. Um, and so we wanna make sure that we have people in the field that are well-versed on what those rights are and making sure that the election officials as well are implementing things that are implemented after Prop 3. For example, even though it has nothing to do with Prop 3, for years, there has been a miscommunication about needing photo ID to vote. You do not need photo ID to vote in Michigan. You can sign an identity affidavit as part of the voting process. Also, for those that don't receive an AV ballot, you are able to go in on election day if you have not received or even if you haven't sent in your AV ballot to vote in person. All you have to do is sign an affidavit that you didn't receive or you haven't sent your AV ballot. So just making sure that people are there at the polls to make sure that the rules are being implemented and re being implemented across the board. In other words, we know from our hotline calls and anecdotal evidence that everybody that goes to a clerk does not get the same information. And you can assume for whatever reason it is, it could be class, it could be the way that's communicated, and it could be just discretionary. We want to make sure that everyone's being allowed to vote with the same rubric and the same rules as others. And so we'll have people at the polling locations to make sure that's the case. In addition, I'm sure many of you are, are well aware of the fear that some people are going to be at the polls to suppress people, whether it's giving them misinformation about who can vote, telling people that if you haven't paid your child support, you can't vote, telling people if you have a felony record or a criminal record, you can't vote. People outside the polls, I'll call, call it havoc, or as some say, standing back and standing by, making sure that we have people in the field to make sure that there are people to counteract that. And so we are gonna have conversations with law enforcement to make sure that there's a contact call. We are gonna make sure that people are aware of what their rights are as well as being prepared for what I'll call de-escalation, for lack of a better term, 
in those instances where those, I'll call it encounters may occur. That's great, thank you so much. Um, so I wanna move now to some questions and answer from the, from the audience, for the panelists. I wanna start with one that was just sent in the chat. Um, let me go up to it. It was about, I loved hearing about the work happening with Detroit Action, Detroit Disability Power. Are there any other organizing examples, examples that have been successful of trying to increase voter registration and participation? Um, I'm gonna let you guys answer. I wanna say one thing, you know, there's also an effort to really help people obtain the right, right to vote who've just been recently released from prison or people who have housing insecurity. And an organization I know who's doing some work with that, with Secretary of State, is um, Street Democracy, which Brandon, I know you, you work with sometimes. <laughs> so, yes. Yeah, those, yeah, those are our peoples and that's, that's actually our, uh, our project with Street Democracy is, uh, is ensuring that, you know, folks who have, uh, you know, so one, one quick story is that, you know, all of our work, all of our work across the board, whether it's the NAACP, whether it's Detroit Disability Power, whether it's Detroit Action, you know, by and large is about increasing civic participation. It's by and large about that. And elections are like one visible outcome of that. But like by and large, it's about increasing civic participation. So the, the, the example that, uh, that you're talking about, like with our, uh, our, our street core, is that in 2012, uh, our, um, our members, you know, were having conversations about the fact that people were having trouble getting, at, you know, um, getting jobs and, have, and, and being able to have access to jobs. And so, you know, the, the conversation, you know, took place. One of the things people talked about was that, you know, there's this opportunity gap. There's so many jobs that are being, you know, for for uh, for people that are being created outside of the city, but there is so little access to getting to those jobs because we have, you know, poor trans public transportation, um, what have you, that many people are having to, uh, you know, risk it, you know, they're driving suspended licenses, they're driving, um, you know, without insurance, whatever, to get to, uh, you know, to, to get to those jobs. And so what we wanted to figure out was how do we make sure that we can A, stop that, and, you know, that and make sure that people who are, you know, who, who are trying to get to and from work, you know, with those sort of like, you know, crime, you know, who are being um, charged with those crimes of poverty don't end up in prison, you know, so a big part of our abolitionist framework is like, we want to decarcerate and we're, and we're doing that, you know, piecemeal. We're doing that baby steps and making sure that there's that there are tons of things that don't become crimes and don't keep don't keep people locked in locked in locked in the system. So long story short, you know, our members worked with the Ann Arbor uh, district district courts to create the uh, the street the street outreach court, uh, street outreach court in Detroit, which is a uh, a criminal diversion court at the 36th district court where if you are um, low income, no income. Uh, homeless, and that's you know the broad definition of homelessness. Uh, and you have any one of these uh, these charges, whether it's uh, you know driving without a license, driving you know with suspend suspensions, or uh, you know driving uh, without insurance, etc. You can go through uh, our program. You can you you can be diverted from the criminal the, the regular criminal system and going through a quote unquote uh, life plan. Getting you know you know getting your uh, you know, which means getting a job, going through AA, you know, a number of different things that you can set up as a life plan. You can be diverted out of the system and have your fines and fees reduced, you know, sometimes down to zero. And so that's our, that's our strategy about, you know, around keeping people out of prison. But for us, that's also a strategy about making sure people, you know, are engaged in the civic process. Because for us, you know, having the, 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 the judges who are in front of us at street court, and who are front of the and who work with street democracy are elected, and so we have to educate people on the fact that these are elected positions. You know, our prosecutors are elected position, et cetera, and so on, and that the people who make decisions for our livelihoods and who make decisions on whether we go we're in and out of prison are people who we can give a, a performance review. You know, by way of an election, and so this is one of one tool. And then you know, I think the other part that I would just say, just to sneak in real quick, is that. You know, we run a, a, a year-round membership canvas where we're out on the doors, we're in the streets, we're at laundry mats, registering people to vote, um, sending text messages, making phone calls, and making the connection between the issues that people care about, whether housing, jobs, criminal justice, whatever,
and making those connections to uh, to, dem to the fight for democracy, which is you know elections and policy. I would just yeah. add that at the michiganvoting.org website, you are able to see our community partners and also able to see the GOTV work that's also part of that um, effort. It's not just rapid response, it's also GOTV um, work being done. That's awesome. And you know, I think the street democracy, the street outreach court that you guys do is amazing because it's really reduced the impact of the criminal justice system on these people's lives. And you connect it to the root cause too, right? You're like, it's not just about what these people are going through. It's about right. who is elected um, that can give people chances in, in the justice system and in the need for people to vote. And the policies that these people, you know, act, policies both, you know, uh, legislative or administrative that they put that they put forward. So that that's that's 100 right. Like connected to the root cause and then connected back to you know people having decision, being able to make decisions among on on the uh, on those uh, political players. Yeah, that's amazing. Thank you so much for sharing that. So to to answer that you know that question that we received, there's I think there's numerous initiatives and there's there's so much action going on and i think one of the power of some of the action that's especially happening around detroit is a lot of it is cross coalition based it's organizations that work with people with disabilities working for people who are, who just came up for being incarcerated working with people who are limited english proficient and they're all working together because usually people have multiple marginalized identities right you can't neatly fit people into these boxes um, so thank you so much for sharing your guys's work so are there any other questions from the audience I see one here. Are there resources for canvassing, poll working, and other voting options when you are not a citizen to engage communities? Um, resources is broad. So I will say that there are um, certainly resources. Um, I will say that, you know, as a challenger, you have to be registered to vote. As a poll worker, you have to be registered to vote, but poll watching is not limited. Although there is a recognition because of sort of the misinformation and the threats that are out there that those communities may not feel comfortable being poll watchers for various reasons related to ICE, et cetera, et cetera. And so um, there are resources available. There are groups that work with those communities. And so I think it's just, again, important to make sure that if you utilize the michiganvoting.org um, website, there's a wealth of information and for those that want to be engaged on GOTV and other efforts, there's certainly avenues to do that, even if it's as simple as sharing information on your social media networks. I would just, just add also, you know, being a canvasser, being a uh, election worker, you know, for a community organization is also a powerful way of, you know, making sure that uh, you have an impact in the electoral process. You know, uh, there are tons of groups uh, like ours that want to make sure that we're talking to everybody, you know, the vote and making sure that we're talking to people who, uh, you know, can vote. And so, you know, we have, you know, both our folks who are undocumented as well as our young people, people who are, you know, 17 and under who are saying like, hey, I can't vote, but vote, you know, vote for, you know, because, because I can't vote for these things that you and I both care about. So I know that like, you know, while, you know, folks who are because of, uh, you know, document status because of, uh, um, citizenship status, you know, there are some people who can't, but like there are a number of ways to impact the system and be able to execute your values and put those forth in the world. Thank you. Thank you, both of you. We have another question that I'm wondering how we can get involved on changing policy on citizenship being required to vote. Um, I'm going to put my lawyer hat on and say that would be a very hard policy to implement. Um, and I think what we should maybe change our thinking on that is making sure that we make the path to citizenship more accessible for all communities. Um, and so I don't think that there's any way that we're going to be able to convince people that you can be a non-citizen and vote in our election. Part of that is security, other issues, etc. But I do think that there is a way to have a conversation about how do we make sure that there's a pathway to citizenship and that it does not, um, it's not based on marginalized communities having ac less access than those that don't. And so um, I would just shift the conversation that way and 
I'm happy to work on that conversation, but I just don't see constitutionally a reason why or we should expend our efforts on that as opposed to making sure that there's a pathway to citizenship. Brandon, is there anything that you want to add? Not, not particularly to that. I think that the, the fight is also about, you know, expanding and um, increasing the pathway to citizenship. But um, Christine also makes a really good point in the chat about, you know, there are non-citizen immigrants, you know, organizing with community groups and, and people of color broadly, you know, on the issues we care about. So, you know, folks like, you know, We the People Michigan, where I'm, a, um, I'm, I'm actually the board president. And, you know, there are other groups like that, that are and like Detroit Action, where we organize on the Southwest side, you know, that are, org you know, where we have, you know, undocumented folks, you know, fighting around jobs and um, housing, you know, these are good places to show up and, um, and throw down because, you know, again, the issues of housing, you know, and, and, and why we have, you know, a housing crisis isn't in a vacuum. It's based on policy decisions and based on people who, um, whom are elect who are elected. That's great. Thank you, Brandon. Um, are there any other questions? You know, I want to uplift one point that you guys made earlier about young people being like a disenfranchised group around voting. And I want to say that the people on this call, I think the majority of people on this call are students and just uplifting the power that you guys have in this process. You know, there's this big 10 uh, challenge at the university where schools compete to see how many students they can turn out and the school social work won and turning out the most the most number of students. And we're hoping to, to do that again this year. And next week, actually, we are having a special debrief just for students around how they can get empowered and get out the vote on campus. We're gonna be having the Michigan director of, um, I believe it's the campaign vote. I have, it's Samaya Ahmed Sheikh. We're having the head of the Big Ten voting campaign um, Aaron Bynes with us and also a um, assistant clinical professor who's very involved in GOTV efforts. That is 1015 and we'll, we'll share some information about that in a second. So just remember you have the power. Young people have a lot of power in this. Okay, so it looks like we have one more question. Are there any initiatives, policies working in Michigan to get voting rights to people who are currently incarcerated? I think we've talked about this. Uh, and several different questions, but is there, is there anything you want to add? <clears throat> so, yeah, we mentioned it a few times that, you know, people who are incarcerated, so long as they're not serving a sentence, you know, can, can vote. So you can get that person an absentee ballot. They can request one rather. They can request an absentee ballot and vote from, from, um, um, you know, from jail. Uh, but there are also like strategies and things that we should be thinking about to make sure that we're expanding the right to vote for, uh, you know, for people who are, um, you know, who, who, who are in jail, um, a serving a sentence. So like our friends at, uh, Chicago Votes in Chicago, Illinois, you know, they do a, a, an entire program called Civics Unlocked, which goes into, uh, you know, Cook County Jail educates folks on um, civics and, you know, then also, you know, does the voter registration and allows people to cast the ballot right there on the spot, you know, via absentee. Um, one of the things that they did that was really successful and they're still working on, um, or they, they're, they're, they're doing that, that could be successful that they're still working on is making the county jail its own um, polling location, which is, uh, uh, you know, you know, so that way, instead of people just solely casting um, absentee ballots, that people who are not serving a sentence can vote. So these are like just some policy, you know, strategies that are out there in the world that people are thinking about. Um, but, you know, in terms of making sure that non uh, me, uh, folks who are um, serving a sentence who are incarcerated can vote, I think that's a longer pathway. And it's also, uh, as Cleveland said earlier, a harder policy platform to, uh, to accomplish. Um, thank you, Brandon. And I just want to uplift that the Detroit branch in the place he actually had a um, program with Wayne County Sheriff and the Detroit City Clerk on Monday, where they went into um, the Wayne County Jail, registered voters, as well as had AB ballots pulled, so they were able to vote in person AB um, during that session on Monday. So there is an effort to make sure that there's local efforts to make sure that those that are not currently current, not currently serving a sentence, but are awaiting, you know, trial and or sentencing 
that they do have the access and it really um, can be an effort that's made through your local clerks as well as your local sheriffs who have the responsibility for the jails. That's great, thank you so much. Um, are there any last questions from the audience? All right. Um, I think that like, you know, you guys really highlighted that suppression is both misinformation as well as just a lack of access and a lack of kind of education about your civic, your civic rights. Um, and you guys both shared a lot of different resources that I think would be really great for students to get involved in and organizations, which we will share with all the attendees after this call. So thank you so much for joining. Thank you and hope everybody has a good election season. We have to think about it as a season, wow. not election day. I know, right. Okay, Trina, I'm gonna turn it back to you. Thank you so much, Kalia and Brandon. You gave so much great information. And so what I hope will happen, in addition to those who are on the call today, live, um, this will also be posted via YouTube. And so you can share this great information with others to make sure that people have accurate information as we get in the middle and through this election season. Um, next slide, please, Fatima. Um, so Aisha's already mentioned this, um, but we are, we have sessions in the past, if you want to look at other things we've done, things about water justice um, um, and other issues that we've done in the past. For this session today, you can get field credit. Um, you'll be getting a quiz um, later in the week. Um, and um, next Thursday, um, we will have at noon a debrief for students on getting out the vote. So what can you do? So Aisha already mentioned this, but Samaya um, Sheikh from the Michigan State Director of Campus Vote Project will be here. Justin Hodge, who's Assistant Clinical Professor at the School of Social Work, will be here. Aaron Bynes, who runs the Big Ten Voter Project, will be here. So if you want to learn more or talk more and have um, dialogue about what we can do as students and on campus, please join us that debrief next week. Um, we'll put some links in the chat about our past sessions and where you can go to um, get links to what we've done in the past and what's coming up in the future um, and also where to RSVP for this debrief session next week. So at this point, I'd like to once again, even though she's no longer on, thank the Secretary of State, Joycelyn Benson, and then give a huge round of applause to Brandon and Kalia for all of their great information and sharing with us today. And so with that, I am closing us out. Thank you so much and have a good afternoon.